All right, hello everybody. Thank you for coming. Um, today's talk is about, it's called Just the Right Pressure. It's about RVSB and clever title award goes to Kai Salkinen, um, who decided not to give the lecture, but just to give the title. Um, the subject today is actually not as, shouldn't be as long as previous topics. So hopefully the pace can be a little bit lighter, a lot more time for anyone to interrupt as always. And if you do, please, do so directly because I might not be able to monitor the chat. And hopefully there will be also be some time throughout this for some integrated spaced repetition. Um, and here we go. So we're talking about RVSP on Echo. I reminded myself to hit record. There in our, on our Echo curriculum, we're here at the fourth lecture, we talked about LV and RV function um, a little bit beyond the basics. And then we had maybe an LV function 2.0 when we brought in VTI. And you can think of this talk as RV function 2.0. Uh, and we'll be introducing the RV inflow view that I've promised. And we'll be talking about how to accurately, as best as you can, measure an RVSP, a right ventricular systolic pressure. And that's our goal for today. So. Before we jump in, why would you want to measure your RVSP? So first of all, it's the best non-invasive assessment and method of quantifying pH as you can. Um, although I would completely defer to our pH group uh, regarding if you're going to be making any, any outpatient or early inpatient pH decisions on its basis without a right heart cath, it's obviously not nearly as accurate as actually getting a right heart cath. The more useful component probably in the ICU setting is that it can help you identify a chronic component of RV failure. I've mentioned in our first RV talk that a PA, that generally acutely an RV cannot generate a RVSP or a PASP greater than 60 millimeters if it's not been previously hypertrophied and previously under pressure. So if you are placing a probe on and you're finding an RVSP that's well above 60, then that patient probably almost certainly has a chronic component to their RV state. Doesn't mean that there's not an acute unchronic component, um, but it does mean that it's probably not just from overnight or from getting COVID yesterday. An important caveat to that is that you can have a failed RV, which might have previously been able to generate a pressure of 100, but at some point it conks out and it's no longer able to generate sufficient pressure. So you can have a normal RVSP, but it would really be called pseudo normalization because this is a RV that's hypertrophy that could have in the past generated a really high pressure. But in this case, because it's completely failed, it's just not contracting and not generating the pressure that it used to. And so therefore low pressure doesn't rule out a chronic component, but high pressure does rule in a chronic component. And as part of this, in the ICU, you might find the RVSP helpful when you're making hemodynamic choices. I've mentioned in the past that sometimes echo is thought of as a method of identifying you know, a diagnosis. Is this a PE or is this tamponade? And that's certainly true at the basic level. But when you're starting to use advanced critical care echo in the unit for patients with complex multifactorial problems and different things that are contributing to their hemodynamic states, then you might want to use your echo not necessarily to pinpoint a specific diagnosis, but really to guide your hemodynamic choices um, as best as you physiologically can. And so using RVSP might help you in that, in, that, in that way as well. So our objectives for today are to introduce the modified Bernoulli equation, which is the only piece of math that you need to know in order to understand what we're doing with an echo when we're measuring RVSP. We're going to review the echo views, this time with a lens for TR, and that's going to include introducing the RV inflow view, and then I'm going to demonstrate how to actually measure the RVSP or the PASP. We're going to briefly touch on the IVC and right atrial pressure, which you'll understand why that's important, and throughout we'll be integrating some pearls and pitfalls to the whole process. So here is a heart, as you know, and you have your right ventricle, which has a certain pressure, and you have your right atrium, which has a certain pressure, and they vary between systole and diastole. And all you need to know is, um, well, sorry, before I, before I say that, when, the, when there is a TR jet, right? So when your RV contracts during systole, and flow is supposed to be going through the pulmonary artery, but many patients, about 80% or so, give or take of patients, will have at least somewhat of a small TR jet. Doesn't mean that it's pathological, but it does mean that they have some amount of tricuspid regurge. And when that happens, there's a certain velocity to the pressure to the blood that's in the right ventricle as it's in this wider part of the ventricle. 
And then there's a faster velocity as it's going through that narrow orifice through which the tricuspid regurg is happening, right? And this is what we're capitalizing upon in order to measure right ventricular pressure. And I'm gonna demonstrate how we do that. And that is with this very simple Bernoulli equation. So we all know this equation really, really well. So I probably don't have to discuss it. But for anyone who would like a simple review, Bernoulli's equation, all these letters and numbers. What Bernoulli is basically saying is if you have a pipe and ignore all the numbers, it's actually all gonna be very simplified very shortly. If you have water flowing through this pipe and you see this pipe has a different, has a height that changes at some point and the width changes, the flow through this pipe per second is the same, right? You're not gonna have, if you have a liter per minute going through here, you have a liter per minute going through here, right? Unless you have some sort of obstruction and then everything's gonna build up and then go backwards. But assuming no obstruction, right? Your flow is the same, but the speed with which the flow is moving is different. To get one liter per minute through the small area, you have to be moving a lot faster than through this wider area. And the speed is just one component of the energy that is required for flow to go through this pipe from this narrow edge to this higher edge. And what Bernoulli says is that the amount of total energy going that, that this bolus of fluid going through this pipe uh, you know, has over here is equal to the same amount of energy over here. And that's what this whole complicated equation is doing is it's actually, it's actually splitting up three different components of energy. So the first is that there's pressure energy. That's the energy that we're going to be talking about. That's the energy that this bolus of water is sort of including, is, is exerting onto itself, right? So this has onto like, if you had a, if you could put your finger in the very middle of this bolus, um, the energy that the pressure that's being exerted on the center or basically the pressure of, of, that this whole, that this whole bolus of water is under, that's your pressure energy. But then there's another form of energy, which is the kinetic energy, the fact that this is moving. And this bowl is moving at a certain speed and, it, and, and rate, et cetera, um, includes some component of kinetic energy. And that includes that the velocity. And then the other thing that sort of determines the amount of kinetic energy required to move this bolus of fluid at a certain rate is this thing here, which has to do with the density of the fluid. So every fluid has its own constant and the density of that fluid is required in order to determine how much kinetic energy is being used to move this bolus of fluid forward into this into this, into this other part of the, of the pipe. And then finally, you have potential energy, which is the energy based on its height relative to gravity. And so because this pipe increases in size, increases in height, the potential energy um, in, owned sort of by this bolus here is going to be a little bit higher. And all Bernoulli is saying is that the pressure energy, the kinetic energy and the potential energy here must be equal to here. So whatever energy it took in order to get higher is now stored in the form of potential energy and is no longer maybe kinetic energy or pressure energy, right? Now, this would be really complicated if we had to memorize this, but the first thing to recognize is that we're talking about the heart today and there's not that much gravitational or height difference between the right atrium and the right ventricle. It's not enough to be relevant for this conversation. And so immediately from our Bernoulli equation, we can remove the effect of potential energy because the heart is the heart, it's sitting in the chest and maybe the patient's lying flat anyway. And it's completely irrelevant when we're in terms of its significance when we're referring to the pressure energy and the kinetic energy of flow within the heart. And then the second way that we can sort of modify this equation is that we know the density of blood. And so this one half P or whatever the Greek term is for it can actually be simplified and actually you could turn it into a four. When you do all your unit conversions and you know the viscosity of blood, which I don't, this can turn into a four. Um, and so now you have Bernoulli's equation has now turned into this modified Bernoulli's equation where we're left with a much simpler equation, which is going to get even simpler. So the pressure here in the RV and the velocity with which the with a bolus of fluid of blood at this point that's in the RV is going to be moving forward must be equal to the pressure energy when it's in the right atrium and the kinetic energy as it's going into that right atrium through that smaller orifice. And so here we're left with P1 plus 4V1 squared is equal to P2 plus 4V2 squared. And you can move this around and say P1, the energy, the pressure in the RV, which is what we're getting at your RVSP is equal to P2. I just moved this over the 4v1 squared to the other side, and I put this into the same parentheses. 
So now P1 is equal to P2 plus 4V2 minus V1 squared. And here's where you get to simplify things th further, which is that physiologically, the speed at which fluid is going to, as which blood is going to be in moving within the RV is usually less than one meter per second, which means V1 is going to be less than one. And as you know, when you square a number less than one, it gets even smaller, right? When you square 0.5, it becomes 0.25. And so therefore, we've all agreed to ignore the V1 when you're suspicious or when you can expect that the proximal velocity of this V1 is less than one, which is almost always the case, is always the case when you're dealing with RVSP. And so now you're left with P1 equals P2 plus 4V squared. And this is your famous modified Bernoulli's equation. And it's just important to go through how it's modified so that you can understand when it may or may not be as relevant or when it may or may not be as reliable. And then if you exchange these terms for the terms that we're actually comfortable with, this means that your RVSP is equal to your right atrial pressure plus 4V squared, RAP plus 4V squared. And this V is referring to the velocity of flow, not in the RV, but the velocity of that tricuspid regurgitation jet. Any thoughts or questions at this point? Okay, and then the last caveat, which I sort of implied before, but didn't mention explicitly, RVSP we're assuming is equal to pulmonary artery systolic pressure, assuming no peripheral, no pulmonary vascular disease. If you have a pulmonary valve outflow and RVOT outflow obstruction or pulmonary stenosis, then the pressure that's required to go through that stenotic valve is being exerted. And then the, meaning the RV pressure that's created is being exerted on overcoming that stenotic valve. And so the pressure on the other side is actually going to be less. And then you can't assume the RVSP is equal to your PSP. And so this is the only math component to this entire talk. So that part is the worst and it's done. So now that we've introduced the modified Bernoulli equation, we have to go through the echo use and figure out where can we determine that velocity of the TR jet. And it's important to know all of them because sometimes you'll only get one. So as a brief review, here's our parasitic long axis view. And as you probably recall, there is actually no tricuspid valve on this view, right? We have our left atrium, left ventricle, aortic valve. This is your RVOT, but there is no tricuspid valve here. So your parasitic long axis view will not yield for you any way of determining what the tricuspid regurgitation jet is. Although we're gonna come back to this because the RV inflow view is a modification from the parasitic long axis view. But I'd like to first start with all the views that we're familiar with. So is there a tricuspid valve in this view? Anyone on Zoom? Not really. Oh, actually, yeah, you can see the tricuspid. Yeah, so we're in the parasternal short axis view, the aortic valve level, probably the most confusing view. Um, and we have left atrium and right atrium, interatrial septum. So this line here, that's your tricuspid valve. And so you might be used to using this view as, as your time to sort of look at the aortic valve, but today's the day where we finally actually take a look at the tricuspid valve. And if you put some color on there and you could put color on all your patients, you might find this. Now this is fast and could be confusing. It just might look like a lot of spurts of color. But remember that red flow, as fast as it looks, red flow or whichever way it looks like it's headed, red flow is still going towards the probe. So that big bolus of red here is blood that's going in this direction. So that's blood that's going from the right atrium past the tricuspid valve into the right ventricle on the normal pathway. But then sort of after that RV and that diastolic inflow from the left, from the right atrium into the right ventricle, focus your attention on this spurt of blue, which sometimes is more crisp, sometimes is less crisp. That's flow going away from the probe across this tricuspid valve. So that is tricuspid regurgitation, right? And so this is the first view when you're doing your general echoes where you have an opportunity to look for TR. And if you see a TR jet that's aligned with your probe, uh, you're able to, you might be able to get a good measure of RVSP, which I'll show you how to do soon. But at least the first step is to recognize that you found tricuspid regurgitation. So moving on to the rest of our parasitic short axis view, the rest of our cardiac echo, we're now below the tricuspid valve, right? So your mitral valve level, your papillary muscle level, your apical level, not helpful for you if you're looking for tricuspid regurgitation. 
So then you go to your apical four chamber view, right? And we definitely have a tricuspid valve here, right? And if you don't put color on it, you might lose the opportunity to recognize that there's some tricuspid regurg. And so again, you put your probe on and you have this hyperdynamic, these spurts of color, but when you start looking at it and you can even sort of pause it and look at them, look at it a little bit slowly, right? You have a red flow going towards the probe, right atrium, right ventricle, inflow from the right atrium into the right ventricle, that's red. And then as that sort of collects there, the right ventricle contracts, and now you have blue outflow, right? Blue going backwards. So again, you have tricuspid regurg. And when you look at it quickly, you might not appreciate it as much. Um, it may take time to sort of tease apart and like train your eye to see bolus of red in, bolus of blue back, but that's definitely tricuspid regurg, which is another opportunity. And this is often going to be one of the best places to get tricuspid regurg because you can see you're sort of really aligned perpendicular or parallel to the heart, um, to, to, the, to not just the heart, but to the right ventricle going into the right atrium. But um, as you'll see, sometimes you don't get it here and sometimes you'll get a good measure from another view. And as we're about to review Doppler a little bit, you'll remember that you really have to be aligned with the direction of flow. And at best, we're doing 2D echo. So you really, in, all the, in another view, even though the 2D view might not look as aligned as you might think, you might, in a three-dimensional perspective, still be better aligned than you are in another view with better color. And then finally, the subcostal view, which sometimes is extremely hard to get some color on, but in rare situations, you can, not so rare, but sometimes, but in, and if you need to rely on the subcostal, because it's usually, it's deep, and it's usually, therefore, you're going to have less gain and less clarity in what you're seeing, and the color might not usually be as clear, but you can also, depending on how it's oriented, sometimes see a tricuspid regurgitation jet, and again, you're seeing that here, this blue jet that's coming backwards. And so finally, I wanted to bring us back to the peristernal long axis, like I promised. Um, and this is something better demonstrated at the bedside, but if you have a peristernal long axis view, then your probe is peristernal long axis and your marker is facing the right shoulder. If you move your probe towards the left shoulder and then angle down towards the right hip, you will open up this. And that is your RV inflow. This is the right atrium right ventricle, and out here I have another view that's gonna be a little bit better, is the pulmonary valve. And so here again, you'll be able to slap on some color, and sometimes this will be the best place for you to get your tricuspid regurgitation jet. And this is not done necessarily often in, um, in your formal or comprehensive echoes. So you might remember the RV takeover sign, which I will never lose an opportunity to say I coined, okay? And uh, the... Uh, that's basically when you put on your parasternal long axis view. And I used to say that if, you're, if you expect to see parasternal long and you're seeing this, this RV, then that's like a sign that you have severe RV dilation, which is not incredibly, um, which is incredibly obvious. But my point is that now, if you look at this again, you might recognize that this is the RV inflow view. That's really what you're seeing all this time. It's the same as this, right? You're basically putting on your, your probe expecting a parasternal long axis, but because the RV is so dilated, it's even taken over the parasternal long axis window so that you don't even need to manipulate your probe in order to find it. You're just finding it right away, which is a problem. Um, but that RV takeover view um, that I love to take credit for is the same as really the RV inflow view. So really not so unique. Um, and if you look here, so here's an example of you putting color on the RV inflow view. So here you can also see, so you can get some really strong TR jets in your parasternal long axis, in your parasternal long axis RV inflow modified view. So now that you've been able to, so we've been able to demonstrate you can find a TR jet in your RV inflow view off the parasternal long axis, in your parasternal short axis at the aortic valve level, in your apical four chamber and your subcostal. So in any of those, you can measure RVSP using continuous wave Doppler. So as a brief review of Doppler, because it can never be um, so I guess I promise no more physics and math, but we're back. Um, as a brief review of how Doppler works, because I think it can never be, I think it can never be said enough because it just takes time to sort of sink in, but this will be quick. Uh, basic ultrasound physics is as follows. You have a probe and it sends out a wave of a certain frequency. And that frequency actually has nothing to do really with the speed with which that wave is moving, right? The, the speed, the, the frequency and the wavelength will vary depending on the speed, but the speed is unchanged. The speed depends on the medium through which 
you're shooting your echo probe, which in our case is soft tissue, which is 15, 40 meters per second. So the echo probe is shooting out these echoes and they're moving at a certain frequency and it hits a stationary object. The sound wave bounces back at the same exact frequency and rece is received by the probe. And the probe knows how fast the sound wave is moving in soft tissue. And it knows how long it took that sound wave to come back. And therefore it tells you that there's a white spot here, something is here. And that's how basic stationary non-moving echo works. But if you have something moving, then there's one sort of modification. So if the echo probe reaches this blood cell and the blood cell is moving towards the probe, then it will adjust the frequency of the wave. So the wave will come back at the same speed, right? And that's really important. So the echo knows exactly where that was, just as if this were stationary, that wave is coming back at the same speed as it went. So the echo still knows, can still calculate exactly where that item, where that piece, where that blood cell was. But because the frequency also changed, the echo is able to use some math and determine the speed with which that blood cell is moving towards the probe. And it's able to represent that to us in a couple of ways, either color or actually by specifically measuring it in spectral Doppler, which we'll get to. Same idea if the blood cell is moving away, right? So the wave reaches the blood cell, it's moving at a certain frequency at a certain speed. The blood cell is moving away. It slows down the frequency, which just increases the wavelength. So the speed again, doesn't change. The echo probe knows exactly where that blood cell was, but is also able to tell you that that blood cell was moving away, and it can tell you how fast that blood cell was moving away. The only major caveat to this is that it assumes, your echo will always assume that you were perfectly perpendicular or really parallel to, parallel to the direction of that flow. And if you're coming off axis, which you almost always are, then you're going to only be getting a partial vector of the direction in which blood flow is moving and coming. And so it's going to be always underestimated. Doppler will always, always underestimate your flow speeds because the equation depends on the angle of this way, of, of, it assumes this angle is zero, cosine zero equals one. So the equation for converting Doppler frequency shift into a speed depends on this angle being one. And if your angle is up to 20 degrees, then you're at 0.94. So you're only sick off by 6%. And that's generally considered acceptable. So we understand that we'll never be perfect. But we say that if we're at least, we think that we're at least within 20 degrees of being on axis, then we're fine. But as long as once you get to 60 degrees off axis, you're now 50% off. And because you never know exactly what your angle is, it's not like you can truly uh, correct that at the back end. And so Doppler reporting, is where the machine recognizes these frequency shifts, converts them to speed and direction, and it shows that to you. This is the equation. That's the cosine, which the machine assumes is zero, which equals one. Um, and I told you already, the speed of, of blood flow, and, uh, the speed of, of ultrasound through soft tissue is 15, 40 meters per second. The machine also assumes this. Um, and the machine will present that to you either as color. So that's how it's figuring out that it's red or blue and where it's coming and how dense it is. Or it could be spectral Doppler where it actually graphs the velocities for you. And in the past, we've spoken about pulse wave Doppler, but today we're talking about continuous wave Doppler. And so we're just gonna highlight the differences. That pulse wave Doppler is where the machine wants to localize specifically where that change of speed is happening. So you tell the machine, I want you to focus on this specific point. We did that for cardiac output where we put the pulse wave Doppler channel specifically at the LVOT. And I only wanted to know the speed of things flowing through this LVOT. And to do that, the machine has to transmit waves, but then wait a certain amount of time to allow that wave to come back before it sends another wave. If it sent waves and listened continuously, it wouldn't know if this was a wave that came back from its first transmission or its second transmission, and it doesn't know exactly where that speed is coming from. So therefore, pulse wave Doppler must limit how frequently it sends out these transmissions, which limits two things. First of all, the depth with, with, with which it can calculate, a, it, can, it, can under, it can read a speed, and also the maximum speeds that it's able to read to begin with. Whereas continuous wave Doppler is where the machine is continuously sending out waves and continuously listening. So what it's going to report back to you is any velocity of anything along the entire line of the continuous wave Doppler, not just within that channel. And I'll show you that in a second. So to again, reiterate the differences between continuous and pulse wave Doppler, continuous cannot localize the VMAX. It could tell you the VMAX and it can measure a higher VMAX, but it can't tell you where that VMAX was. Whereas a pulse wave Doppler will tell you exactly where that VMAX is, but it is limited. There are some times that where you'll get what's called aliasing and you won't be able to actually measure it because it's just too deep and too high for the pulse wave Doppler to figure out. 
And therefore, when you look at the readings, the spectral Doppler readings, continuous Doppler will almost always give you a filled in envelope, which I'll show you, whereas pulse wave Doppler is an unfilled envelope because the bolus of stuff that's moving at that specific point is generally uniform. So it's going to be moving at one speed. So you'll see that bolus moving, whereas continuous wave Doppler is going to be capturing speeds along the entire line. And then also continuous wave Doppler, there's no gated channel to place, right? Whereas in pulse wave Doppler, obviously you have to place your channel strategically exactly where it is that you want to be measuring speed. So I'm going to show you a side by side in a minute. I don't know why I put it after um, of what the, uh, the pulse wave and continuous wave Doppler readings will look like. But for now, I'm going to go back to obtaining your RVSP. So now that we understand how to use continuous wave Doppler and we understand how to find your jet, right? What you need to do is find your best TR jet. And usually that's in the apical floor, but we're, you should be doing them at every single opportunity um, because sometimes you'll find that uh, you get a better one somewhere else. And by better, I mean a better waveform and also a higher number, because like I mentioned, you're always going to underestimate with Doppler. So if you get great waveforms in three different views, you're not gonna average them. You're gonna take the highest one because that's the one that was probably most aligned with the flow. So you take your, you find your continuous wave Doppler, you find your TR jet, you take your continuous wave Doppler cursor and you slap it over that jet as best you can over the direction where that jet is going. And notice I deliberately created this fake diamond here where it's up here. Some people like quibble about where to place that diamond. That diamond is meaningless. What that diamond does is it differentiates this, this Doppler cursor from pulse wave Doppler cursor, which looks more like an equal sign. That equal sign has to be placed exactly where you wanna measure speed. But what this is gonna do is it's gonna measure speed of blood here. It's gonna measure speed of blood here. It's gonna measure speed of blood here, even the speed of blood here. And it's gonna report them all to you without telling you which speed belongs to who or where. Right, so it doesn't matter where you put that diamond, even though you can, the machine does allow you to move it, I guess, so that it doesn't obstruct your view. And then you hit play, you're going to get a VMAX. And this is what a nice TR jet will look like. It's nice and round. It's often usually a little bit even more symmetrical than this. And in a perfect world, you really want to get a crisp envelope here. So you almost might see it here, but I wouldn't take this because it's not really crisp enough for you to know, know. like, for example, this is actually probably the correct spot where you ignore these whispers or whiskers and you take the one that's sort of true, um, not these added, th these little whiskers that really don't necessarily mean anything, but you take where the clean curve um, comes around and you place your pro your, your marker there. I really maybe should have put it here. And what you're getting here is time. And here on the y-axis, you're getting speed, right? In centimeters per second. And because it's going away from the probe, it's charted as a negative, and therefore it's coming down from your baseline. And you might notice that I had to move the baseline up if you, by default, this baseline is really in the middle. And then it sort of tracks speed going towards the probe and speed going away. And here, by moving the baseline up, I told the machine, ignore the efforts of blood going towards you. I just want you to focus on blood going away because even continuous wave Doppler has its max. And so you move this baseline up so that you have all the room for this envelope to sort of come all the way down and you measure your Tmax here, your Vmax here. And the machine will tell you that your TR Vmax is 3.17, 300 and, or 3.1 meters per second or 3.2 meters per second. And you can almost see that, right? That's just straight up from your Y axis here. And then if it's 3.2 meters per second, four V squared is equal to 40. And it's giving you your gradient, right? The gradient is 40 or 40.4. So, the RVSP though here is 45, right? And that's because to get your RVSP, you have to add right atrial pressure, as you know, from the very beginning of this talk. And this machine, it was automatically set at five. So the machine, which I, you know, plug in. So the machine knows the RVSP and then the machine knows that you set an right atrial pressure of five, they add the two, and now you have your RVSP of 45. In general for critical care echo, a TR jet of greater than 2.8, is considered abnormal, really kind of regardless of right atrial pressure, but it's assuming that you're gonna basically come out at something that's 35 and up, which is strictly speaking going to be abnormal, maybe 40. And again, we're talking about systolic pressures, not mean PA pressures. And I defer to our pH group, all the important differences between you know, mean and systolic and what you're going to do with that from a pH perspective. But from using this to like determine the chronicity or the RVSP of your acute critical care inpatient, um, usually for most, for most algorithms and using the American Society of Echo Guidelines, greater than 2.8 is considered abnormal, but that's not really as important as using this in the context of your patient and maybe knowing what it was in the past or maybe helping to identify whether or not there was an acute or a chronic, whether or not there was a chronic component to their pH or to their right ventricle. Um, and like I mentioned at the very beginning, 
getting also, you can have pseudo-normalization where the RV is completely failing. So even an RV that could generate a pressure of 100 yesterday is maybe doing nothing today. Um, but moving back on this, this is the side-by-side -side that I promised you that probably I should have put earlier. So in continuous wave Doppler, because this Doppler is sort of measuring the speed here and the speed here and the speed here. So at some point, like at this point in time, right, there is speed going through the tricuspid valve at this there's blood going through the tricuspid valve at this speed. There's also blood just circling around the right ventricle, maybe not doing much at this speed. And there's blood here, perhaps at this point, at this speed. And that's why you're seeing this filled in envelope because, or there's blood here that could be at this speed or at this speed. So the envelope is generally filled in because you're capturing all the speeds of any blood doing anything along this entire line. We're assuming because we know that the, it's most likely that you're peak gradient is coming from your TR jet. There's no reason to think that your peak gradient is coming from anywhere else, that this peak relates to, belongs to the TR jet. When you had your pulse wave Doppler and you were putting your pulse wave specifically through the left ventricular outflow tract, and you wanted to know the speed of blood going through here, well, the speed of blood going through here isn't all different speeds of all different kinds. It's generally a bolus of blood that speeds up and slows down. And that's why you don't have this filled in envelope. That's why you have this non-filled in envelope. And when you have a filled in envelope in pulse wave Doppler, that's probably a sign that you're very off axis and you're capturing blood that's going in many different directions, even at that one point that will, where your gated channel is. So if you do this at your parasonal short axis, so back to here, your aortic valve right here, your parasonal short, you can do this here too. And you throw your Doppler on and you're getting what doesn't look like maybe such a beautiful tracing. And I bring this here to demonstrate that this whole system doesn't necessarily work when you have massive or necessarily torrential TR. And there's two reasons for that. The first reason is that you have such rapid equalization of pressure between the two chambers that you basically lose your gradient before you can figure out what it would have been. And the second reason, depending on, sometimes this is more relevant when it's a little bit less severe, is that Bernoulli's equation only works, or really applying Bernoulli's equation to echo only works when you have non-laminar flow. Because when you have laminar flow, the speed of flow in the center is faster than speed of flow at the periphery. And we have to assume that the speed is the same at that specific spot across the entire, across the entire bolus. Um, and so when you have smaller amounts of TR, it becomes turbulent and then it's not laminar flow and then all the blood is generally moving at the same speed. Whereas when you have laminar flow from just wide open TR, um, it's not necessarily gonna be as accurate. It could be accurate and it's possible that this is in this specific patient's case, an accurate envelope, but I wouldn't take this to the bank in any way. I wouldn't use this to tell me that, oh, my, my RV is probably fine. Obviously it's almost certainly not, but um, well, actually I shouldn't say that. I don't really know much else about this clip here, but the, uh, the point is that you have to take everything, you have to take this grain of, with a grain of salt and what you're gonna say about it when you're talking about torrential TR. You cannot necessarily rule out that there's a severely high RBSP or pH in this patient. Um, I just said that. Okay, and then back to our RV inflow view. And this is another clip that I found, I forgot when I took this one, but this one I actually wanted to, to share also just to sort of reiterate that you're seeing right atrium, right ventricle, and then you have the pulmonary valve. So if you remember this beautiful RV uh, demonstration that we showed in the first RV lecture and you sort of flip it on its side, you can almost appreciate how you're seeing this RV. The LV is really on the bottom. That's just how the probe is oriented, right? But you're seeing the tricuspid valve and then the pulmonary valve. This is sort of like another unique view of getting the RV because the RV's three-dimensional structure is really difficult and challenging thing to wrap our minds around. And this is just one other opportunity to start to figure out what you're seeing at which view. So that's really what your RV inflow is doing. And then here too, at your RV inflow, you can slap on a continuous wave Doppler cursor. And here, even though you seem to have, you seem to have a nice jet, you're not getting a great waveform. And I think part of that is because I'm not really that much on axis, meaning you can't determine if, it, you can't make the continuous wave Doppler line come off the side. It always comes center. It's always centered on the probe itself because that's what's measuring. And so if you can't align yourself properly with the flow, you're not gonna get a good reading either. And so here, unfortunately, I would love to align a cursor right here and get a really nice reading, but I can't. I can only take the cursor from the top. And then here I'm cutting it off probably by more than you know 60 degrees or whatever it is. Um, and therefore I'm not getting a good reading again. And then here you have an apical four chamber view. This was a patient recently on the pulmonary consult service who almost doesn't even have a tricuspid valve. 
right? This was still, and you probably know this patient. <laughs> um, and, uh, and then here also, you can see that you're actually getting almost a decent waveform, but you're not getting, it's not this symmetrical envelope, which is another clue that there's something off with what's happening here. You have rapid equalization of pressure. You maybe have almost entirely equalized pressures because it's really just one big chamber, right? And again, this is not going to be someone where you're going to be using your RVSP very much <laughs> to say anything. Um, and then I just wanted to show one of Stevens from this week, last week, um, but also had a decent apical four, very good apical four chamber view and able to find the wave. And you might say like, hey, I'm not gonna get a great RVSP on this because I'm only seeing like a wisp of that TR. But one of the benefits of spectral Doppler also is that it doesn't necessarily relate to your 2D view. So if you can use the color Doppler to at least show you where you should be aligning, you might still be able to get a really good envelope, which Stephen did, nice job, right? And here you see it's nice and it's crisp. It ends right there, right? And it's round and it's symmetric and it's deep. You can get used to seeing these. And then again, you put in your RVSP, it's 39.7, It's or excuse me, it's, it was the peak rating was 29.7. In this case, we did MGH protocol and added 10 for the right atrial pressure. We're about to get to right atrial pressure as the last point here. And then you turn that normal looking gradient into a very abnormal looking gradient um, by adding 10 as your assumption for the right atrial pressure. So that perfectly brings us to the last point, which is using the IVC or other ways of determining right atrial pressure. Because you can imagine that, you know, your right atrial pressure can range from, you know, generally zero to 20 or whatever CVP you're seeing. And that can significantly impact your measurement for the RVSP. And so, and it's not that the right atrium is therefore driving your RVSP and therefore for some reason it doesn't reflect RVSP. That high right atrial pressure is pressure that the right ventricle has overcome in order to accomplish that TR jet of that velocity. So yes, it's a high right atrial pressure, but that doesn't detract from the fact that it definitely also means that you have a very high or at least that much in addition to your right ventricular pressure. So correctly estimating a right atrial pressure is sort of like undersold. And in fact, those guidelines that I told you that talk about a TR jet of 2.8 don't yeah. even say anything about your right atrial pressure and don't make any assumptions about it. So, but this can very much impact your measurement, your, your result. So if you want to estimate right atrial pressure, you can use the American Society of Echo Guidelines, which are as follows. You guys know I hate the IVC, but all you have to memorize are two numbers. One is 2.1 centimeters and the other is 50%. Because if you have a small IVC that's less than 2.1 centimeters, don't memorize this yet because I'm gonna take it away in a second. But if you have a small IVC of less than 2.1 centimeters and it's collapsing a lot, more than 50%, then you probably have low atrial, low right atrial pressure. It's small and it's collapsing a lot. So less than 2.1 centimeters, greater than 50% collapse. So you have a range of, you know, the ASC will tell you you have a range of zero to five. You can say that the right atrial pressure is three. If you have the opposite, jumping to the high end here, which is not aligned well, but if it's greater than 2.1 centimeters, you have a wide IVC and it's not collapsing at all. It's not, or by at all, I mean less than 50%, which is a ton. But if it's not collapsing more than 50%, then you have high right atrial pressure and it's 15 millimeters of mercury. And if it's one or the other, but not both, collapsing more than 50%, but it's greater than 2.1 centimeters, or it's less than 2.1 centimeters, but it's not collapsing, then you can say you have an intermediate right atrial pressure of five to 10, and you can maybe say that it's eight. And this would be more accurate than maybe just doing what MGH does, which is just saying that everyone has 10. This is at least a way of sort of choosing for your patient the closest value. Um, and so here you can see that this is a patient, right, who has a very small IVC, is less than 2.1 centimeters. It's not measured, but you see these dots are each a centimeter. This is probably less than two of them, and it's collapsing 50%. So this would be a three. And then you have this patient with a really dilated IVC, and it's not collapsing at all. This would be a 15. The problem is that this has only been validated for spontaneous breathing patients, which is why I told you not to really remember this. It's gonna be helpful if you're using it, I don't know, anywhere else on the wards um, in a patient who's not intubated. But for many of our patients where we're doing this on, um, you can't use this to calculate right atrial pressure because it does not work for mechanically ventilated patients. So the method, and I can teach this to you very quickly, um, but it's complicated. The method for estimating right atrial pressure in mechanically ventilated patients requires two hands and the technique is as follows. No one knows. There's no way, right? So you can't really use an echo. No one really knows how PEEP affects your CVP and your right atrial pressure and how much the patient is spontaneous, what component of what the patient's doing is spontaneous versus, versus positive pressure. So you can't really use an echo 
or to you know try to best guess your right atrial pressure. You might want to take CVP, although no one still will really know how much that's relating to the right atrial pressure necessarily. You could. Um, you could do the MGH method of saying 10 for everyone, but the bottom line is that uh, you don't really know and you just have to use your best judgment. So maybe use your CVP, maybe just assume 10. But whatever you're using your RVSP for, just re recognize that this is an important limitation to it. Obviously there are patients we think are not gonna have a very high CVP or a very high rate atrial pressure. And therefore you don't have to worry about it too much. If it's someone who you suspect has a very high rate atrial pressure, then you might need to count it for more, right? And that's sort of the takeaway from all critical Caraco stuff, which is nothing is really gonna be set by a textbook. It's really gonna depend on the clinical context and how you're trying to apply the principles. And therefore that understanding what's behind the principles rather than memorizing numbers is critical to appropriately applying critical care echo. If you don't understand the, impl the implications of Bernoulli's equation, um, which don't relate so much necessarily to TR because it's almost always gonna be fine for you except for those cases of torrential or massive TR, which I mentioned. There are times when Bernoulli's equation is used for estimating aortic valve gradients. And then the assumption, but if somebody has a narrow LVOT or an intra or an LVOT obstruction, then that V1 that I mentioned at the very beginning, that proximal velocity is actually going to be more than one and modified when this equation doesn't work. So you have to sort of understand, it's not enough to sort of just memorize these numbers and how to acquire images without understanding what's behind them, which is sort of the point. Um, so in summary, you can use continuous wave Doppler to assess TR from any available view. You need to ensure you have a clean envelope, non-laminar flow, your highest value is gonna be your most accurate and you have to add right atrial pressure, but you have to consider its clinical utility. And that's all I have for you today. Happy to take any questions. And uh, hopefully Sasha is too for pH questions. <laughs> Do you mind repeating very quickly again the, the reason why in torrential TR the calculation is not as uh, reliable? Yeah, so the first thing is that that peak velocity depends on there being a significant gradient between the two chambers. But when that tricuspid, so there might be a, a transient gradient when that valve initially opens to begin your torrential TR, but once it opens wide, then you know your two chambers equalize so quickly that you're gonna get a falsely low uh, TR jet because that velocity is just gonna slow down because you're gonna lose your gradient very, very quickly. So it's not gonna accurately reflect the RVSP. If you do get a good envelope for, you know, you might be able to use it to assess a minimum, um, but the other caveat is the second reason, and I'm not sure how this would affect whether or not you should use it at all, which is that in, in uh, when you have torrential TR also very often that flow is, oh, or severe TR that flows off in laminar. Um, and when it's laminar, then the speed of the bolus is different even within the same spot. Even when you're getting your, your peak gradient, it's not reflecting all the flow at that spot because the, the flow at the center of that laminar flow is gonna be moving faster than that peripheral flow. And so it might over or underestimate your, your reading. I have to think about if it'll over or underestimate. I'm not sure right now on the top of my head. Um, but the, the bigger issue is your equalization of pressure. Gotcha. Thank you so much again. Sure. All right. I guess I will end it here if there are no more questions. Um, thank you all so much for coming.